So there abide faith, hope, and charity, these three. But the greatest of these is charity. Words taken from our epistle today. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Today we will consider a third motive for our penances, charity, especially charity for our neighbor. <clears throat> Usually, when we talk about charity in Lent, we are referring to almsgiving, and while this is very important, today we will consider how all of our penances can be acts of charity. As we see in our epistle, charity is all that remains. It really is all that matters. Every penance imaginable performed without charity is absolutely nothing. And little penances done with pure charity are everything. Charity is the only purpose of any good action. It is the only driving force behind anything good that we do. Now, someone might say, if charity is all that matters, why do penance? Why not just love people? If you have charity, and you have nothing to atone for, why do you need to do penance? Why do anything for Lent? Why not just be good and kind and loving for our neighbor? Suppose, too, suppose you are young. Suppose you have already satisfied all the debt to your sins. Suppose you have no great sins to satisfy for. Suppose you are already living a life of prayer, free from attachments. Well, to answer this, let us consider such a one, or at least one very close to that. Today we take for our example, and our inspiration for Lent, the great Saint Rose of Lima. She lived in Peru from 1586 to 1617. She lived to be only 31 years old. She was one of our great American patronesses. She led a very holy life from the moment of her birth. She had no long life of many sins to atone for, and yet she was called by God to afflict herself with many and severe penances for the great majority of her short life. These are just some of her penances. Even as a girl, she fasted constantly. What little food she took was either bad tasting, or she added bitter herbs to make it so, and then rinsed her mouth out with sheep's gall afterwards. She wore a hair shirt and scourged herself with knotted ropes until she bled. When she was 18, she made her sir, herself a bed consisting of broken bits of pottery, gnarled tree roots, and other sharp things arranged in a long narrow box with a piece of wood for a pillow, and slept on this for almost the whole rest of her life. And what sleep she did have, she slept only about two hours a night, devoting the rest of her time to prayer and penance. She made herself a crown of thorns out of nails and pewter, and wore it surreptitiously under her veil. As she grew older, she whipped herself with heavy iron chains, and frequently poured cold water all over her body. Her severe penances made it so that she could barely walk unaided to church, almost fainting on the way. But once she received the Blessed Sacrament, she found incredible new strength. Would that our communions might enliven us as much as these did her. This is not all. The further she progressed in devotion and in perfection, the greater penances she undertook. She bound her arms with tight cords till they swelled, she whipped herself with nettles and thorns. She lengthened her hair shirt and added needle points to the inside. When her confessor discovered and forbade her to whip herself with chains, she took one and fastened it about her waist with a padlock, such that it eventually got buried in her flesh 
and had to be cut out. She exchanged her first crown for one with 99 spikes that dug continually into her head. On top of this, she endured peacefully three weeks of additional agony before her death, where she said that, though she knew she deserved it all, she had never known that the human body could suffer so many things at once. She was tormented in every limb, her head and in her bones, and afflicted with a myriad of illnesses, pneumonia, asthma, gout, fever, and others. One of her biographers has said that for these last weeks of her life, God seemed to gather into one all the separate sufferings that his beloved servant had endured through life. We should note, though, that the Church offers us St. Rose for our admiration, not imitation. It takes a special election, a special gift and grace from God to undertake such penances, and things like these should only be done with the permission of a wise confessor. But her example should give us pause when we, much more sinful than she ever was, hesitate to undertake our little penances this Lent, which seem as nothing by comparison to hers which she endured not for a mere forty days, but for most of her life. Now let us go back to our question. Why? Why then? Why would someone so pure, who had overcome what few faults she had, maintain such penances and, and then increase them? Why is it that when she grew in virtue and grew in perfection, instead of saying, oh, well, my penances have worked, <clears throat> instead of saying that, she says, oh, now it's time to increase my penances. Her penances were not so much for atonement of her past sins, and they were not so much for her own detachment, but they were done principally for charity. She was called by God to do penance for two reasons. First, to be more fully united to Christ, who suffered so much for us, and second, to suffer for the same reason that Christ did, for the salvation of the whole human race. This should inform our own penances. As much as we need to do penance for ourselves, for the purification of our sinful past, as much as we need to do penance to get greater detachment from worldly things and distractions, we should do our penances to be united more fully to Christ, to be like him whom we love, to do them on behalf of others in need of doing penance themselves. <clears throat> so, when you feel your enthusiasm for your own penances begin to lag, when you want to cut yourself some slack this Lent, when you no longer wish to do penance for your own benefit, do it for others. Do penances for worldlings who do none. Do them for struggling Catholics, for people struggling with addictions. Do them for fallen away Catholics. Do them for your enemies especially, for those who have sinned against you and are not yet sorry who owe penance to God for their sins against you yourself. This is a great way to bless those that curse you, to do good to them that harm you. This is to be like Christ, to bear the burden for their sins. <clears throat> Charity is the most perfect motive for penance, because it is Christ's only motive. He had no sins of his own to expiate. He had no greater close he needed no greater closeness to God. He needed no greater detachment from the world. 
His only motive was charity towards man, to carry the burden due men for their sins. Our penances, then, can only be perfect when they are done in charity and for charity. So again, when you do penances that are hard and unpleasant, like taking cold showers, long fasts, rocks in your shoes, and these other things, remember why you must do them. This is fitting punishment for my sins. This will further detach me from the world, but most importantly, this will help someone in need. This will help someone who's struggling right now, struggling with temptation, struggling with those sins of the flesh. This will help my enemies. This will make me more like Christ. This is my little act of love for God. This is my chance to love God just a little bit, like how St. Rose of Lima was called to love him. Finally, if you have made the total consecration to our Blessed Mother Mary, or if you are making it, then give her all your penances. But you can still ask her to apply them to your enemies, to those who are struggling, and so on, all in accord with her good will. For our own Blessed Mother Mary, who had no sins of her own to suffer for, is our co-redemptrix because she suffered with Christ all his sufferings undertaken for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.